Well, I'm believing with you for a supernatural encounter with God. I want to talk to you about the five miracles of knowing God's extravagant love. Five miracles that come into our lives from knowing God's extravagant love. Are you ready for your miracle? Let's see what they are, right? Grace, the grace of God that we talk about so often is the story of God's love. In fact, in Psalm chapter 89, verse one and two in the Message Bible, David or the writer says, your love, God, is my song. Your love, God, is my song and I'll sing it. I'm forever telling everyone how faithful you are. I'll never quit telling the story of your love. Boy, I can identify with that because I'm never going to quit telling the story of his love because Jesus came to reveal the love that God had for us. He came to obliterate every distorted view of God that man had accumulated over 4000 years of human history at that time. 2000 years ago, there were 4000 years of completely misunderstanding God. Man had a, a, a failed glimpse, a, a, a real mistaken view of what God was really like. So Jesus came to obliterate the concept of an angry God that puts you in a box of demands that you have to live it, live with. So many Christians grew up with a checklist, the rules and the regulations and the checklist of having to make sure they were always right with God. Some of you grew up with the idea. Some of us grew up with the idea that God was an angry tyrant. That he was looking for moments when if we ever stepped out of line, he would put us back in place. Boy, we grew up with a wrong concept of God. But to grow up more, to continue to truly grow, we have to understand this extravagant love that God has for us. And I'm asking everyone right now to locate yourself. You know, sometimes we have to locate ourselves on a map and when we're looking to where we're going. We see on the map where we're going and we see where we are. I want you to locate yourself. And what do I mean by that? Well, the multitudes, when they followed Jesus, they said, Lord, feed me. They wanted to eat the disciples. When they followed Jesus, they said, Lord, teach me. They wanted to learn. The apostles went even further and said, Lord, use me. They wanted to be used by God. But then John, the beloved John said, Lord, love me because John wanted to be loved. And we wouldn't have the book of John and first, second and third John and the book of Revelation had had it not been for John desiring that revelation of love. Locate yourself. Are you with the multitudes? Lord, feed me. There's nothing wrong with being there, but we want to move on from there to the disciples. Lord, teach me to the apostles. Lord, use me to John. Lord, love me. Just love me. You know, in John 13, 23, I've talked about this verse many times. There was leaning on Jesus bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, leaning on his bosom. You know, Grace talked about last week the way that the woman that came out of the wilderness, she came leaning on her beloved. When you are leaning into God, when you're leaning into his love, when you're leaning upon his love, when you're resting on his love, he will bring you out of whatever storm you're in, whatever valley you're in, whatever wilderness that you're in, whatever desert you're in. God describes his love for us when he talks about Solomon and his bride in verse chapter four of Song of Solomon, verse nine. You have made my heart beat faster. This is Jesus talking to us. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. What are we wearing around our neck? The love of God. What are we wearing around our neck? He bought us. He redeemed us. He loved us. He made us. He he created us. He purposed us. He destined us. Why would he love us this much? Why? How does he love us this much? It's a mystery, but his heart is full. You know, when somebody falls in love, they can't always explain why or how they don't can't necessarily put their finger on a particular characteristic of that person. They're just their heart is just full. Their mind and their heart are just full of love. And that's how Jesus is towards us. His heart is full. His mind is brilliant. 
And yet the smartest man, the fullest man, the God man. It says that you make his heart beat faster. I know how hard that is to grasp, but I find myself again asking the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you today to have a true view of God, the God who is love. That's why he gives grace. That's why we live in the grace of God. We stand in the grace of God. We stand as the righteousness of God because of love. The cross is love. And see, a distorted view of God will defeat you. A distorted view of God will damage you. A distorted view of God will confuse you. A distorted view of God will make you run from God rather than run to him. I want us to have the right view of God and I want us to take this message of who he is to this world. There's a world to win. We got to get we got to stop getting caught up in all of the 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 minor things, the the things that are not the majors. We need to major on the majors. We need to let go of focusing on anything other than winning this world to Jesus. Now you need to do your job. You need to work your business. You need to do all those things. But seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, trying to advance his kingdom by bringing the message that will heal this world, that will change this world. Religion can't solve it. Religion has only brought confusion. But a relationship with a God who is love is the solution to all that ails mankind. You see, all conflict and all evil in this world is a war from the devil against God's love. This is what Satan hates the most. The devil's number one goal is to distort your view of God through religion, condemnation, inferiority, shame, prejudice, racism, any other way possible. Satan is using it all to lower your sense of true worth and your sense of true purpose by giving you a distorted, less than view of Jesus. And this is what Jesus came to do. He came to obliterate every distorted view of God that man had accumulated for 4000 years. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 45, whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. Jesus came to represent and demonstrate who God really is. In first John three, eight, it says for this purpose, the son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, what are the works of the devil? The works that he came to destroy was the wrong concepts of God. Jesus came to destroy the wrong concepts people have of God. The idea that you need to change in order to God to be good to you. Jesus obliterated that. The idea that he's angry. Jesus obliterated that. The idea that he's distant. Jesus obliterated that and came to live among us. The idea that sometimes he says yes and sometimes he says no. Jesus obliterated that. The idea that he wants you guilty or condemned when you sin or fail. Jesus obliterated that. The idea that maybe he'll heal you, maybe he won't. Jesus obliterated that. The idea that God keeps a list of your sins like Santa Claus. Jesus obliterated that. Hebrews chapter eight, verse 12 says that your sins and iniquities, he will remember no more. The idea that God is going to judge you after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. If you're born again, Jesus obliterated that concept of God that he is seated as a judge. Oh, there will be a judgment, but he will judge you according to what Jesus did rather than what you did when you simply accept him as your savior. Why would John be the one who said, Lord, love me instead of just Lord, feed me, Lord, teach me, Lord, use me. What made John be the one who said, Lord, love me? What is it that drew John to Jesus bosom? No judge would draw someone to their bosom, no angry God, no punisher, no abuser, herder, hater or someone less than perfect love would draw us to him. I love what Jeremiah 31 says in the Message Bible. It's such a beautiful passage of scripture. And, you know, if you're familiar with Life Changers International Church, you know that this is one of our cornerstone verses that we talk about a lot. And I'm not done talking about it and I probably won't be done talking about it until Jesus returns because it has revolutionized my life. My view of God has been changed, evolved. We, we're, we're, we don't back up all the things that we've said in the past. I don't 
I don't back up all the things I've said in the past. I, I had a distorted view and little by little we're seeing clearer and clearer and it's okay to evolve. It's okay to, to admit we've been wrong. It's okay to admit that we didn't see clearly. Even the Bible says we see through a glass dimly, but then we shall be seen on that day that he returns. But I love this passage in Jeremiah 31, verse one through six. This is the way God put it in the message Bible. They found grace out in the desert. They found grace out in the desert. The old way is dried up. The old way of relating to God in the desert, that's dried up. We need to find grace. They were looking for grace in the desert. These people who survived the killing, you've made it this far. He said, you've made it this. You're watching this because you have made it this far. God brought you this far. He's not leaving you in the desert. He's not leaving you there. He's not leaving you anywhere. He's never leaving you, period. It says Israel out looking for a place to rest, met God who was out looking for them. We have it mixed up so often that we were searching, we were looking and somehow we found God. No, we were searching, we were looking, but he found us. And then God told them because he was looking for them and he's been looking for you. I've never quit loving you and never will. I've never quit. I hope someone hears this today by the power of the Holy Spirit revealing this to you on the, from the inside out. I will never. He said, I've never quit loving you and never will. Expect love, expect love and expect more love. And so now when you shift your expectations, I'm getting to the five miracles here, but when you shift your expectation upon from God's going to judge me to God's going to love me. Now, he says, I'll start over with you and build you up again. You'll resume your singing. There's going to be joy grabbing tambourines, joining the dance. You'll go back to the old work of planting vineyards on the Samaritan hillside. So you'll sit back and enjoy the fruit. Oh, how you'll enjoy those harvests. Whew. Wow. John knew the love God had for for him. God is love. First John four, eight says that God is love. Everything he did, he did because of love. In Malachi, chapter one, verse two, I've always loved you, says the Lord. I've always loved you, says the Lord. I've always loved you, says the Lord. He's speaking to you right now. I've always loved you in my dark days. I've always loved you in my bright day. In, I've always loved you in my update. I've always loved you in my down day. I've always loved you in my backward days. I've always loved you in my forward days. I've always loved you in my young days. I've always loved you in my old days. I've always loved you. Here are the five miracles of knowing God's extravagant love. Number one, when you understand or when you get a glimpse of God's extravagant love, I've always loved you kind of love, uh, expect love, love and more love kind of love. Number one, it calms your heart. It calms your heart. Boy, we were living in a nervous, anxious world right now whether it has to do with finances, whether it has to do with terror, whether it has to do with shooters, whether it has to do with sickness or disease, whether it has to do with the economy, whether it has to do with people's health, the pandemic that we endured, whew, the political divisions that are in our country, let alone the world. We need something to calm our heart. What is it? It's God is love kind of calm. It's a God is with me kind of calm. It's a God will never leave me or forsake me kind of calm. It's a God will never break his promise to me kind of calm. Number one, it calms your heart. Ephesians chapter two, verse 13 and 14, for he himself is our peace. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. God is love. And so he himself, Jesus, he is our peace who made both one talking about the the Jewish people who thought they were the chosen who they were the chosen ones to bring Christ to this world, not the chosen ones to be the only ones to keep Christ in their life, but to be the ones who spread the gospel and they will again spread the gospel. But it says he broke down the middle wall between the Jew and the Gentile, it broke down the middle wall of separation that was separating man from God and man from man, people from each other. In the Passion Translation, it says our reconciling peace is Jesus. 
He has made Jew and non Jew one in Christ by dying as our sacrifice. He has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us and has now made us equal. No matter who you are, black or white, male or female, whatever background you have, he has made us equal through our union with Christ. Ethnic hatred, it goes on to say, ethnic hatred has been dissolved. The crucifixion of his precious body on the cross, the legal code that stood condemning every one of us has been repealed by his command, his triune essence has made peace between us by starting over, forming one new race of humanity together in himself. This tearing down of the wall between God and man, between man and man, he is our peace. It'll calm your heart. There are so many things that are stressing our hearts. There are so many things that are stressing our lives. And Jesus has come to calm our hearts. His love calms our heart. Your, your heart is never calm when you feel unloved. Your heart is never calm when you feel rejected. Your heart is never calm when you feel like you're on the outside looking in. Your heart becomes calm when Jesus is your peace, when you understand our reconciling peace, the peace that we long for in our soul is found in Jesus. Jesus is our peace. Number one, it calms your heart. I just speak calm over your heart. Jesus said, peace, be still to the storm. And the Bible says, and the waves and the sea, there was a great calm. There was a great calm. Boy, there's something about this feeling calm, this feeling cool, this feeling at ease, this feeling of peace, this feeling that knows everything's going to be all right. It's never you're never sure of, of that until you realize this extravagant love that God has for you. Number two, what this extravagant love will do. The second miracle is it will elevate your expectations. It will elevate your expectations when you discover how high and how wide, how deep is his love, it will elevate your expectation. Who's ready to have their expectations elevated? I'm saying over you right now, your expectations that were here are going to go here. If they were here, they're going to go even further, high, further up. They're just going to go higher and higher because of his great love for you. It says in Ephesians chapter three, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That is happening already. That has happened that you being rooted and grounded in love. Why are we studying and trying to figure out everything in the Bible when the root of all our peace, the root of all our expectations, the root of all healing, the root of all breakthroughs is love. Love is the root. So we should focus on the root. We got to stop picking on everybody's fruit. We got to stop saying God doesn't accept that guy. God doesn't accept that girl. God doesn't accept that sin. God doesn't accept. He doesn't accept any sin. And all of it was put on Jesus on the cross so that he could accept you freely. He rejected Jesus on the cross so he could accept you forever. And we got to stop picking and choosing which sins are the really bad ones and start and stop condemning people who are not like us and stop picking sides and stop taking sides and start taking dominion and start taking souls and start believing for breakthroughs and start believing for your family members salvation. Believe for your neighbor's salvation. Believe for your loved one's salvation. What is more important than than when we die? Where we are going to spend eternity is the most important thing in this universe. And I'd rather spend eternity with God in some suffering place than to spend a moment in heaven without him. Thank God it is as he said it is, and we will spend eternity with him in heaven. But he says that verse 18, he goes on to say that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It's deeper than your own brain can figure out your own knowledge, your own mind, your own brain cannot fully wrap itself around this kind of love that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then look at what he says in verse 20, one of the most famous verses of all. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us, which is the love of God is the power that works in us to him. Be glory in the church 
by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love this translation in the Passion Bible. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Did you see the resting place of his love? Then you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, how deeply intimate and far reaching is his love. This is where intimacy between you and God begins in being just blown away and being in awe of his love, his how deeply intimate and far reaching is his love, how enduring and inclusive it is, not exclusive, inclusive, meaning no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how judged you feel, no matter how holy you think you are, God is willing to include you if you would just say yes to Jesus finished work on the cross. The scripture goes on to say endless love beyond measurement that transcend that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this continued pouring this extravagant love pouring into us continually, pouring through us continually. Every person who needs this love to sweep away their past, sweep away their fears, sweep away their insecurities, sweep away their addictions, sweep away their bad habits, sweep away their disappointments, sweep away their pain. Let that love, that extravagant love, Lord, continue to manifest and awaken and revive every soul within the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus. He goes on to say, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. Woo! Listen to this. He will achieve infinitely more, infinitely more than your greatest request. Have you been making some great requests? Go ahead and keep making greater ones because he will exceed them. He will exceed them. He will achieve them infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. You have some dreams that are not believable. Keep dreaming those. Keep believing for those. I dream my family salvation, I dream every person that I know walking with God, experiencing his peace, experiencing his love, experiencing his goodness, experiencing his grace. I have a dream of seeing him one day and knowing just as I am known. I have a dream that all of my loved ones will be in heaven with me. I have a dream that you and I will be able to experience some heaven on earth even before we get there. I have a dream that will stop talking about politics and talking about entertainment in this world and start truly experiencing a love unlike any other. The above and beyond. The beyond our wildest imagination kind of love. The message Bible says that Christ would live in you as you open the door and invite him in. Somebody needs to invite him in right now. I don't know who that is, but I'm asking you right now. Stop and pause and invite him in. He said that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. Would you just do that right now, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life, just invite him in. Just say, Jesus, I open the door. I invite you in. You know, he stood at your door knocking. He won't knock it down. He won't kick it in. He's a gentleman and he knocks like a gentleman and he's waiting for you to open it. Just say that, Jesus, I open the door and I invite you in. Maybe this is your first time that you've ever invited him into your life. Then you know what? Just inviting him in as your savior. That that's the assurance of your salvation. Just inviting him in to as many as received him. The Bible says to them, he gave the power and the right 
to be sons and daughters of God. Maybe you've already invited him in, but you need and want and to experiencing him, to experience him at a deeper level, to experience this intimacy with him. Just invite him in. Jesus, I invite you into the most intimate place of my soul, the most intimate place of my life. I invite you in. Come on, pray that out loud. Jesus, I invite you into the deepest place. I invite you into the hidden places. I invite you into the secret places. I invite you into the places I haven't even been willing to admit. I invite you in. And that's a guarantee that he will come in and dine with you. And Paul goes on to say, and I ask him that both feet planted firmly on love, you'd be able to take in with all Christians the extravagant, the dimensions, extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. You would reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights. Who's ready to rise to the heights in the love of God, that we'd live full lives, full in the fullness of God. God can do anything, you know, verse 20 goes on to say, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. And listen to this part. He does it not by pushing us around, not by bullying us, not by shaming us, not by making us feel guilt. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Speaking of his spirit working deeply and gently with us, this leads me to the third miracle of understanding or beginning to re realize this extravagant love in Isaiah chapter 43. This love of God, when you know God's nature is love, it heals your soul, it heals your heart. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse three, it says a bruised reed he will not break, describing Jesus a bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. I love this verse in the Message Bible. I started seeing this really when the pandemic started and I just started digging around this passage deeper and deeper and it's just it's reached me. It's touched me. It's, it's made me laugh. It's made me cry. It's made me feel deeper things than I've ever felt before. And it says he won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt. He won't disregard the small and insignificant, but he'll steadily and firmly set things right. He won't tire out and quit. He won't be stopped until he's finished his work to set things right on Earth. You know, the first thing that he sets right on Earth is your soul, your heart. Once you're born again, his number one intention is to heal your brokenness, to fill your emptiness, to fix what's damaged, to free what has been in bondage, to free you, to fill you, to fill what's been empty, to fix what's been broken, to free what's been in bondage to flood your soul with his love. I love this verse so much. That he won't brush aside the bruised. Have you been bruised? He won't brush you aside. Have you been disregarded? He won't brush you aside. He won't disregard the small. Have you felt small? He won't disregard you. Have you felt insignificant? He won't disregard you. He won't ignore you. He won't stop until he's finished the work to set things right in your life. The things that are imbalanced, the things that are broken, the things that have been unfair in your life. God's going to set those things right. He's going to heal you. Whatever the damage is, he's healing it now. Invite him in. He'll start healing you. This is the this is the result. This is the miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that I'm standing here today. It's a miracle that many of you are watching today. It's a miracle. We're not in prison. We're not dead. Maybe you are in prison. You're definitely not dead, but maybe you are in prison watching this or hearing this or listening to this. And God is reaching you right where you're at. 
He hasn't forgotten you. You're in the hospital. He hasn't forgotten you. You nobody has remembered you or your birthday or your what's your, what you're going through. But he remembers and he will not brush you aside and he will not. People will brush you aside. People will disregard you. We got to stop trying to get people to treat us better. And we just have to realize that God makes up for all of that. God makes up for whatever has been brushed aside, whatever has been ignored, whatever has been felt small or, or insignificant in your life. We can't try to get people to give us our worth or to give us our value or to give us our affirmation. Boy, when people need that from others, they are people that you don't want to be around. And we don't want to be that kind of person when we have everything that's been given to us in Christ. Woo. He will heal your soul. That love will heal you. Jesus, heal the broken, heal the damaged, heal what's broken in me, heal what's broken in each person connected to me right now. Two shall agree about anything to ask. It shall be done in Jesus name. Amen. Just receive that. Just say, I receive the love of God that heals my heart and heals my soul. Number four, the fourth miracle. Of this extravagant love is it eliminates your doubts. It eliminates your doubts. Boy, when there's nothing that feels more anxious in my life than when I'm doubting, when I'm doubting, I'm going to get somewhere on time when I'm doubting somebody's going to do what I hope they would do when I'm doubting that I'm going to make it through something or some situation. Uh, it brings anxiety, all doubt and all fear come from the ignorance of God's promise, not knowing God's promises or the ignorance of his love. In fact, his love is his promise. When our heavenly father says, I love you, he he doesn't just mean he has feelings for you, although he does has deep feelings for you. But when he says, I love you, he means I will never break my promise to you. I will never break my promise to you. Somebody needs to get a hold of that, that you're not the one who is going to get God to change his character. You are not that powerful that no matter how bad you've been or no matter how undeserving you've been to for God to keep his promise to you, it doesn't change his character. Your bad character doesn't change his good character. Your broken promises do not cause him to break his promises. And anybody else who's broken their promise to you does, cannot be the template that you take and that you stick on your expectation of God for him to treat you how other people have treated you. No, he's not like other people. God is love. He doesn't just have it. So love eliminates all fear. First John. For verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. I like how the message Bible says it this way. Love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day for our standing in this world is identical with Christ's standing. As he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear. There is no room for fear. He said, there is no room in love for fear. Well formed love banishes fear. Perfect love, that is. And only perfect love is God's love. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one who has not been fully formed by love. Or when we have a. A fragmented view of God's love. So number four, it eliminates all doubt. You become sure God's going to keep his promise when you believe God is love. Love always keeps its promise. And number five, a revelation of God's love protects you from guilt and condemnation. Again, in this passage in first John four, 17 and 18 in the message, this way, love has the run of the house, he says, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Judgment Day isn't just when we stand before God. To enter into heaven by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus, Judgment Day is whenever the devil is trying to accuse you, whenever the devil is trying to judge you, whenever uh, your own heart is trying to judge you, whenever anybody else is trying to judge you, we can stand identical with Jesus because he's made us joint heirs with him. In first John three, verse 20. It says. Even if our hearts condemn us, 
God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things, even if our hearts condemn us. Has your heart condemned you? Has your heart made you feel guilty? Are you feeling guilt and feeling condemned because you know what you did was wrong? It's OK, because even when your heart condemns you, God is greater than our heart that condemns us. He knows all things. You know a few things, but he knows all things. He knows all things. He knows what he's done for you is enough for whatever you've done or wherever you failed or whatever you're missing it. Whew. This love, it protects you from condemnation. It's called the breastplate of right standing with God. And one one passage of scripture says the breastplate of love and righteousness, the breastplate of love and righteousness, which is God's approval. Love is God's approval. That's what righteousness is. You stand approved by God through what Jesus did. You stand approved by God. And I got a bonus for you, a bonus gift, the sixth thing that a real revelation of God's love will do. It will make you safe. It will make you feel safe and vulnerable and it will cause you to fall in love with him. We love him because he first loved us. He makes us safe. We can be vulnerable with him. Vulnerability is the secret to intimacy. And who is this Jesus? Who is this savior? that would love us so much. Well, I'll close with this description of him in the Passion Bible of Song of Solomon 5 verses 10 through 16. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. She said about Jesus, she had a glimpse, she got a revelation of Jesus. A prophetic revelation, he alone is my beloved. He shines in dazzling splendor, yet is so still so approachable without equal as he stands above all others, outstanding among 10,000. The way he leads me is divine. His leadership so pure and dignified as he wears his crown of gold. Upon this crown are the letters of black written on a background of glory. He sees everything with pure understanding. How beautiful his insights without distortion. In his eyes rest upon the fullness of the revelation, the river of revelation flowing so clean and pure. Looking at his gentle face, I see such fullness of emotion like a lovely garden where fragrant spices grow. What a man! No one speaks words so anointed. The Bible goes on to say, describing Jesus. No one speaks words so anointed as this one. Words that both pierce and heal words like lilies dripping with myrrh. See how his hands hold unlimited power, but he never uses his power in anger for he is always wholly displaying his glory. His innermost place is a work of art so beautiful and bright. How magnificent and noble is this one. Woo! How magnificent and noble is this one covered in majesty. He's steadfast in all he does. His ways are the ways of righteousness based on truth and holiness. None can rival him. It doesn't matter what anybody else has done to you. None can rival him, but all will be amazed by him. Most sweet are his kisses, even his whispers of love. He is delightful in every way and perfect from every viewpoint. If you ask me why I love him so. If you ask me why I love him so brides to be, it's because there is none like him to me. Everything about him fills me with holy desire. And now he is my beloved, my friend forever. Jesus, give us a revelation of yourself that will truly reveal to us your extravagant love for us. Open our eyes to see, open our heart to feel, open our mind to comprehend, to begin to compre comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height to know 
the love of God and the God who is love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God loves you so much. I hope you're encouraged by this. I can't wait to talk more with you about our sweet Savior. What a man, the greatest of all. I love you guys, and we'll see you at our next service. God bless.